I could plonk on this table a telephone from what, circa 1950, and it would be a very simple piece of apparatus, and you could always take it to pieces and play around with it, and the number of components would be minimal. But now if we take a modern phone and look at it, an iPod or an iPad or whatever they call them, uh, the complexity and the difference in complexity is huge. Well, I'm sorry, but the same thing has happened to government. What was very, very simple in the 1500s became more complicated in the 1700s, became extremely complicated in the early 20th century. And today, where we have a global government on top of regional governments, on top of thousands of different institutions, it is complicated and there is no getting around it. It is complicated. And what I'm going to try and do is try and make it as simple as possible to explain not why we should leave the EU, that I take as red, but how we do it. In order to leave, it has to be a very structured process. And the reason is, for 40 years now, we've been in the EU, we have integrated laws, we've integrated trade, we have uh, developed numerous cooperative enterprises, far too many to actually list, thousands of them. And all these complex arrangements we have are all interwoven with British law to such an extent that if we suddenly cut off the process, there would be absolute chaos. So in order to leave, we have to look at structures and procedures and, as it says here, options. And the first one you see up on a list is WTO, standing of course for World Trade Organization. And the idea is that we uh, leave uh, in minimal, uh, minimalistic style with minimal negotiations, minimal agreements, and just say we rely on the World Trade Organization to dictate our, our world rules, which do dictate the world trading structures, and we rely on those structures and we trade on the basis of that. The second option we can deal with is what is known as the bilateral route, which is about thee and me. It's about negotiations between two parties, hence bilateral. In other words, we make a special deal with the EU in the same way that we see the Swiss have made their own deals with the EU, and also the Turkish uh, have a very special deal with the EU uh, in terms of the customs union. And then there's a third option, uh, simplifying things uh, outrageously in terms of what we call the Norway option, which is membership of EFTA, the European Free Trade Association, which gives us entry into what is known as the European uh, Economic Area uh, through the, economic, the EEA agreement. So basically we've got three ways of actually looking at a, an immediate post-exit option. What matters is not the detail, but the context. And its context tells you and determines everything. The context is not what we would like to see when we leave. It is what we need to tell people in order to get their approval, their assent, to get us out of the EU. And unless we can convince people that the leaving experience is safe and that the end result is secure and basically positive, it doesn't matter what we believe is optimal. We're never going to see it happen because we simply will not win the referendum. So the context of the exit plan is what does it take to win a referendum? That is the context and that is what guides us through the early stages. The guiding light is to pursue and obey the treaties and it will be a matter of depositing with Brussels what is known as an Article 50 negotiation which gives formal notice that we are going to leave and sets in train a series of negotiations. And it's those negotiations which are two-way. This is not a question of us telling them what we want and them agreeing. Negotiations are two-way. And it's that framework that we're going to have to satisfy people on before we actually even get that far. 
the big killer is what Mr. Salmon found. It's an American term. I think it was coined by IBM, if not by one of those organisations. It stands for fear, uncertainty, doubt. It means projecting the idea that leaving is a leap in the dark, that it's dangerous, that there's all sorts of hazards involved, and if we do it, we will be inestimably worse off. It's a classic technique for what is known as the status quo effect. In other words, where you're trying to convince people not to make a move. That's what we're going to see in the referendum. Fud, fud, glorious fud, as the song goes. So, to win a referendum is we're going to have to fight the fud. Neutralise it. That's going to be numero uno. If we don't get to neutralise the FUD, we're not even off first base. The fact is that we don't want to be fighting detail, because detail bores people. Do we lose 3 million jobs? Do we lose 3.5 million jobs? Do we lose 2.7 million jobs? Do we actually lose banking jobs? Do we actually have to deal with trade in services? We don't want this detail. It's not going to win us. It's going to bog us down. What we have to do is neutralise it completely. So it's not part of the picture because it doesn't matter because it's not an issue. How do we do that? We simply say, well, we'll leave the EU, but we're not going to leave the single market. And all of a sudden, almost at one stroke, we're free. Article 50 gives us two years to do it, basically. And this is the next nut. We've got two years. We've actually got more if everybody agrees, because Article 50 says that basically you have two years, clock starts ticking once you notify. Uh, if at the end of two years, and there is no unanimous agreement to continue the negotiations over a continued period, then automatically the treaties fall. So if we haven't actually agreed by then, we're out anyway. And that is disaster. I see more or less a political imperative that says that basically two years and you're out. So we're now actually building a sort of template here. We've said to ourselves, right, we're going to have to protect the single market and we're going to have to do it in, within two years. Switzerland, we saw has a bilateral negotiation. It took them 16 years to actually get to the stage where they want, and it's incomplete. So the idea that we can actually build a custom-built bilateral agreement with Brussels is a non-starter. So what you want to be able to do is look at the EEA through EFTA. And the reason for that is because it is a single body of work. It is a fixed agreement surrounding the uh, single market. It's got more or less what we want in it. It gives us more or less free trade with the rest of Europe. And it gives us the terms and conditions which the other members obviously will accept because they're in place and they are trading on that basis themselves. It's a lot of the talk is about the exit option or the exit plan. But I've added a line in the short term. This serves not as your final solution, horrible term that, but as a temporary, as a temporary expedient that we can live with in the short term. And once we're out, then we can start talking in detail. And it's then that we start building a new vision, a new world, as long as we've safeguarded the existing arrangements and given ourselves a base on which we can then develop. The naysayers will say, if you leave, if you go EEA route, you will immediately suffer a huge loss of influence. And it was a continuous theme throughout British policy that we cannot afford to have a Europe making the rules where we're not at the top table 
alongside the rest making the rules which are determining the trading and other conditions throughout Europe. And it's based on a few myths. One of those myths is that the EU actually makes the rules, which it doesn't. And we'll look at this in a minute. It also suggests that we do have a seat at the top table, when in fact we don't. Let's look at this mythical top table. 323 votes spread between 27 countries, we have 29 votes. That's our mythical top table, which gives us 8% of the vote. Let's go to EFTA, and let's look at this terrible position where we have no influence. Well, actually, they do. They have what's called a tripartite structure, where on the one hand, you have the institutions within EFTA, on the other hand, you have the European institutions, and then you have the joint institutions where there is a continuous flow of information, negotiation, and discussion over new measures, which are then settled informally before they actually get into the rigour of the formal institutional procedures. Deals are done through this sort of system. And it's at this sort of system that the Norwegians are absolutely superb players. And there's no reason why we wouldn't be either. Now, here it gets really interesting. That is the EEA Aki. In other words, the body of law. And this categorizes them by subject. Look at the big red slug. Technical regulation, standards, testing, certification, 33.6%. Look at this slug. Veterinary and cytosanitary matters, 28%. Look at this one, 8.6, it's only a small one, transport, but so on and so on. Environmental, 4.8. Most of it is technical legislation. These are the sort of nitty gritty. We talk about all these torrent of laws, but that's what they're about. I am certainly not going to storm Westminster because they turn the standard for jam, for, for sugar and jam from 78% to 80%. It's not something I'm that actually worked up about. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we're talking about. That's where we lose our sovereignty, or do we? Because here is the very, very interesting thing. All this torrent of laws isn't actually made in Brussels. They don't make them in Brussels anymore. They used to, but they don't do it. We are talking about standards agreed, not in Brussels, but by international conventions, by international treaties, particularly and especially, but not entirely, through the United Nations, and also non-treaty organisations Things like the uh, Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, who makes all the laws on banking, not Brussels, not the Bank of England, but Basel, the Basel Committee. Lots of these things going on. And it all comes down to this. And he's cutting and filleting fish to an international standard. And it's the same standard that we obey, it's the same standard that Brussels obeys, it's the same standard, roughly, that Russia obeys, that the United States obeys, that China obeys, that Japan obeys. And the working organisation is known as Codex, in full Codex Alimentarius. It makes probably the bulk of EU technical standards. And it's based here in Rome. You think Brussels is big? That's got 5,000 people working in it. That's your government. It's in Rome. It's on the shabby suburbs of Rome. They've got 5,000 bureaucrats working on there, on your law, which they then fax to Brussels. You want fax law, it's the bureaucrats in bus Brussels that are sitting by their fax, waiting for the next codex standard coming through, telling them what they're going to adopt and what they're going to put through the system that becomes law. As long as we're in the EU, we delegate that authority to the Brussels bureaucrats who do the job for us, and we no longer have the access. So we leave the EU, what happens? We resume our seat, and we start making the laws again in Rome and elsewhere, 
and Brussels does as it's told, and it does as it's told, as we'll see in a minute. That's it, and this is the European Union's redundancy notice. They didn't realise at the time, but they signed it, they've ratified it, they've agreed it. This, ladies and gentlemen, look upon it in awe, because this is what is going to actually get us out. It is the 1992 Uruguay Round World Trade Organization Agreement on Technical Barriers to Trade. What it basically says is that if there is an international standard, because a whole range of issues, anything to do with trade, if there is an international standard, okay, you are obliged to adopt that international standard in preference to your own. So in other words, if you, Brussels, have a straight cucumber regulation, and out comes an international body with an international standard on straight cucumbers, you have to drop your own standard and accept theirs. Now, Brussels has signed and has ratified this. It is part of the Brussels acquis. It is mandatory as far as Brussels goes. It doesn't say may. It says where technical regulations are required and relevant information stands together, Members shall use them. Not may, shall. Now, look at our brave new world, and that's what it looks like. EU member states, that's us at the moment, okay? Here are the real lawmakers. There, the big box in the middle, okay? Now, as an aside, a lot of the standards are made by International Standards Organization. I've used that, if you like, as a, a proxy representing all the standards-making organizations. Look at the arrow. It feeds in to the global bodies. Where's the arrow between EU member states and the lawmakers? We're in one. We drop out, go into EFTA, look at the arrows. Suddenly, we are talking direct we're talking direct here, and of course, when the standards are produced through EFTA, all that happens is that having decided what's going to happen, they go down to the EU, which tops and tails them, gives them a brand, stamps on them, gives them identity, and churns them out unchanged back through the system. So yes, Norway does get its rules from the EU, but it's actually made them in the first place. That's the system we will be tapping into. So, loss of influence? I think not. We get people in the CBI and others saying, oh, we've got a car industry, and if we're not in the top table, we lose all the standards. We're not able to make the standards. And all these technical, horribly detailed technical standards on, on cars, whether you have indicators and whether you have mirrors and all the rest, is decided by Brussels and we will have no say in it. Rubbish. It's not true. It's absolutely not true. There's a different organisation. It's called UNIS. Anybody ever heard of it? United Nations Economic Commission, Europe. So we have a 58-member organisation. And when it comes to international rules on vehicle standards, it hosts a body called the World Forum on Vehicle Harmonization, which has still more members, including Japan, and they globally set up the rules on vehicle standards. Well, if you look at the standard, it's got an EU label on it. But it ain't made in Brussels, it's made in Geneva by the World Forum hosted by UNIS. And if we leave, we go back to Geneva, speak for ourselves, and we build the standards as co-equals with Brussels, not subordinate to it. So the idea that we lose influence if we get out and go through the EFTA route is absolute nonsense. It's a complete myth. We actually gain influence because we gain seats at the world forums. Now, I talked about straight cucumbers. And of course, with great fanfare, Brussels abolished the straight cucumber directive. It never was a directive, it was actually a regulation. But they abolished it, or did they? 
There is no straight cucumber directive in Brussels anymore, I can guarantee you that. What there is, is a marketing standard. And it says, in order to conform uh, and thereby be legal to sell a cucumber, it must actually conform with the common marketing standard, which is actually determined not by Brussels, but hey, by Eunice. And what you're doing is looking at the Eunice standard. That's come straight out of the manual from Eunice, which tells you the minimum standards for selling a grade A cucumber. And it will allow you a bent one, but only just. But there you are, the rules have not disappeared. They've simply moved from Brussels to Geneva. And that is where we need to be, Eunice. Okay, so what's next? This is the big deal. These days, we are now seeing the march, the steady march of globalization. And when you talk to these Europhiles, they're the little Europeans, they're obsessed with Europe. But there's this great big world. So when we look at the single market, it's too small for us. We need to be looking at the bigger world. And you can see the effects of this. Any one of you can get on an aeroplane and go to Japan, and if you've got an iPod or if you've got a camera or something and you need a battery, you can go to a little corner shop in Tokyo and you can say, hey, can I have a AAA battery? And you can get one and you can put it in and it'll fit. That didn't happen by accident. That happened because of global regulation and that's the business, that's the game we're in. So steadily, we need to break away from little Europe and rejoin big world. Now, here's the interesting thing, and this is where we really start breaking new ground. Change the whole structure of the system in Europe, proper Europe, continental Europe, and turn it from a Europe of concentric circles into a Europe of hierarchies. So the word is hierarchy, and in order to do that, the thing we joined in the first instance, we have to abolish. So actually, we go into the Norway option, we join the EA if we're allowed in, and the first thing we do is negotiate its abolition. That's stage two. <laughs> so it's not the final option, it's the interim option. The go in with the full intention of destroying it, to end up with that. Now the point is that the bulk of the law, as I said, is made by international bodies. Now, true European body is not the EU, it's UNIS. All countries in Europe are in UNIS, not all countries in Europe are in the EU. Now what we do is we adopt this not as a ruling body, not as a government, but as an administrative body, the job it's doing already. It's taking on board, facilitating, processing international standards, some it makes its own, some it pulls in, and then passes them down to its members. Now all of a sudden the circle's gone, and you can see we have a hierarchy. A community of equals. That's the phrase you walk away from here with. A community of equals. Equal is F to plus, which is F to plus us, plus anybody else who wants to join. But we're co-equal with the EU. Not subordinate, not on the outer ring, but co-equals under the sun of Eunice, which is exactly the structure that Churchill first set out in 1948 when he talked about hierarchical and having global bodies and then regional bodies. It was his idea. So we go back to Churchill to have regional structures and beneath that we have sub-regional structures in a hierarchical but not a subordinate position. And of course you bring in all the other states of Europe, including <coughs> Russia, without all the political baggage that goes with it, because this becomes a true European-wide single market. And it's a trading market without the baggage of political integration. So we have to look outside the EU and look towards existing structures and work with them as is happening, even though it's invisible, 
that nobody understands, or very few people understand, but it's happening, it's real, and this is what we could do, is adopt it. Now, we then go into our next phase, because actually, when you start talking about free trade agreements and all the rest, it's a shambles. Do you know what the biggest and fastest growing international uh, business trading opportunity is at this moment, with the biggest turnover and the biggest rate of growth. Anybody? Tourism. No. You got busy. No. No. Strange enough. Anybody? Drugs. Close. Drugs, he says. No. <coughs> yes. Yeah. International organized crime. It is by far the biggest industry and it is growing exponentially, it is out of control, and every time you create a free trade uh, agreement and re 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 reduce the controls, crime moves in and is taking the system apart. For every single bonus point towards global GDP, uh, G uh, GDP we get through free trade, we lose twice the amount through losses in organised crime. Yet we're looking glibly talking about free trade agreements without integrating a common approach towards dealing with the criminals. And of course the criminals are feeding the terrorists, so there's this nexus between criminality and terrorism which is feeding off the very system that we're creating. But we're not looking holistically. Global trade is going backwards. It is now more expensive Average tariffs 20 years ago were 10%. Average cost of trading in non-trade barriers is 20%. We are going backwards, not forwards. So we actually have to look beyond narrow Europe. You're not intended to read this, but this is phase three. I'll spare you that. But we actually then have to take a structured, hard, cold look at how we organise trade how we deal with trade, how we regulate trade, how we deal with less developed countries, how we structure our agreements. And that becomes an eight-point plan, which is actually the future. So the future isn't Norway option. The future isn't little Europe. The future isn't even units, but it's a global issue of actually looking how we do business and leading us through the morass to become United Kingdom, part of the bigger world and not this corrupt, snivelling, dismal little construct that's grey inside grey in Brussels, getting us absolutely nowhere. You have nothing to fear but your grey. Or nothing to lose, shall we say. Now that's the point. And this is where we come, fortunately you'll be pleased, to a conclusion, because Brexit, as we start it off, becomes Flexit. And FLEXIT is a rather clever acronym, even if I say so myself, meaning flexible response and then continuous development. And this is then what we see, and I won't bore you with this because you can see it on the website, which I'll give you in a moment, <coughs> but there is your structure. It is possible to have a structure. We start off with Article 50. We go through various preliminary stages, we make certain decision paths, and if we don't get after there are alternatives, we then come to an agreement, having dealt with all the other uh, problems. Possibly we have a referendum, I think we do, to agree, and then we start talking about getting rid of EFTA, setting up UNIS, and then picking up an eight-point programme. So there is an integrated, sequential plan that can work, can take us through, can leave us better off and ends up, as I say, with flexit, flexible response. In other words, we're not going to be dogmatic. Whatever goes is flexible. But the real issue is continuous. The leaving the EU isn't the end of the process, it's the start of the process. It gives us an enabler. It enables us, once we're out, to start redefining the territory redefining the vision, redefining our position in the world and starting to make a positive contribution to, if you like, to use that terrible but important phrase, the new world order. But we do it in our shape and our image 
instead of through the eyes of Brussels and we rejoin the top tables and start making it work. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is it, basically. It. It's simple yeah. <laughs> until you look at the details. Thank you. <laughs>